Good afternoon. This is Butch Howard coming to you from Appalachian Baptist Church in Greater South Carolina. I hope that uh, you're enjoying the blessings of God during this time as we merge into uh, June, uh, pretty much into the midsection now as time is uh, going by so swiftly. Uh, the whole month of May, I was dealing with some physical stuff and uh, time just seemed like a blur the entire month. So I feel like I'm behind and uh, the summer has already kind of started without me, but I'm glad to be uh, able to get back into the flow of ministry. Thank you for praying for us. I appreciate it so very, very much. We want to continue our study today in this great themes of the New Testament. We have been dealing with the theme of the return of Jesus Christ and as I mentioned earlier, this is a two-stage event. There is the rapture of the church, and there is the return, physical, visible return of Jesus Christ to this earth. So we want to continue. On this particular slide that you see, uh, this is probably the only slide we get covered today because I want to move slowly. Uh, I want to uh, start out with a passage in Colossians chapter 1, if you can be turning there. Today, the operative word is global. I'm going to try to explain some reasons why past generations of believers have been maybe off in their estimation of the timing of the coming of the Lord at the rapture event. Uh, as you know, people have been saying all of our lifetime, Jesus is coming at any moment, and so we want to try to get into some of the reason for that. But the word today that will help us tie all of this together is the word global. Write it down and remember it, the word global. And as we move through these things, they'll start to make a little more sense, and some connections will happen in our thinking as we take the scriptures, what they say, and connect into this word global. So we'll get into that in just a moment, our first passage being Colossians chapter 1. But before we do that, we want to pray uh, that God will open the eyes of our heart, that we will understand the scriptures. With uh, this being the information age and the internet and so many resources for learning, Christians, particularly, are without excuse for remaining ignorant of the precious Word of God. Ironically and sadly, we still have a lot of believers who only read their Bibles in a token fashion. In other words, they will have a five-minute devotion, a ten-minute quiet time. They take their Bibles to church and leave them on the shelf the rest of the week and we still have not come to be hungry and thirsty for spiritual things. The junk food of the world has quenched and suppressed our spiritual appetites. That's actually one of the signs that we're approaching the end of the age of grace. So let's pray and as we make these connections today, my prayer is simply this, that God will help us awaken to where we are in time, awaken to the prophecies that God has given to us to warn us and to equip us for the days and for the time in which we live right now. Father, we love you. We are thankful that you've given us this blessed book. Lord, we are ashamed that we do not read it with more heart, with more passion, that we don't read it more often. So many simply have laid it aside. My prayer today is as we see these things that you have said to us, that it will provoke a hunger and a thirst for your word. Open the eyes of our heart. Grant to us spiritual discernment and understanding and wisdom for these very critical, chaotic days in which we now live. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, we have said that the return of Christ is a two-stage event. The first is known as the rapture of the church. And yes, we know the word rapture is not found anywhere in the English Bible. We get that. The Latin word rapturo is, and that's where we get our word rapture. The Latin word comes from a Greek word, which is in the actual text in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, is the Greek word harpezo. Harpezo means a sudden, unannounced, instantaneous snatching away. There's a force that literally is going to bring the dead in Christ from the grave and the living from the earth. And we will be joined together in the air, together to meet the Lord. And we will forever be with him. There are a lot of folks that have really struggled with the timing of this rapture event. And uh, I mentioned in in the introduction that we were talking about a single word that will help us with this. And it's the word global. I want you to look at this passage in Colossians, and then I want to try to explain what Paul was thinking here. Of course, he was writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but he says something, and you remember Paul was a wordy guy. Uh, when I was in uh, Bible school preparing for ministry, our English teacher there said that the Apostle Paul was the master of the run-on sentence. And to give you an example of that, I'm, like, I'm one of those guys that, really do not like to start in the middle of a sentence. So if you would go back with me to verse 3, we give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have to all the saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven whereof you have heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you. This is what I want you to see. As it is in all the world and bringing forth fruit, as it does also, also in you since the day you heard of it and knew of the grace of God and truth. As ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. That's the whole sentence from verse 3 down to verse 8. Wow. When we think about this phrase that we read in verse 6, it causes us to pause. In Matthew, Jesus said that one of the signs of the end of the time of grace, the the times of the end, that the gospel would be preached in all the world. That was a prophetic sign. We now read Paul here probably in the early 60s A.D., about about 28 to 30 years after Christ went back to heaven. And in verse 6, he now says, the gospel is coming to you as it is in all the world. So was Paul... Uh, wrong in his statement? Was he misspoken? Uh, Exactly what is going on? Because we know from history since that the gospel had not yet reached China, the gospel had not reached South America or North America, and great portions of Europe still had not heard the gospel. So this is not a contradiction Uh, This is not a false statement by Paul, but you have to live in this era mentally here and you realize that Paul was a Roman citizen. And at that time, the greatest power on the face of the earth was the Roman Empire. And Paul would have said in his thinking process, it's very similar to what uh, we Americans say that America is the greatest nation on earth and uh, anything that happens in the world, basically, uh, America has got some role to play in that. But this word global now comes center 
uh, stage in our thinking, Jesus said the world would hear the gospel. Paul said, basically is saying here, we really scrutinize his words. The Roman Empire has been the facilitator in the gospel being spread as far as it had at that point. Now, the Romans are responsible for the advanced and extensive roadways. It's their one of their great contributions to uh, human history. And this is why God allowed the Roman Empire to be in place for around 600 years. From the early days of the Roman Empire until they uh, crumbled around 314, 315 A.D., the Romans were able to build extensive road systems, and it paved, no pun intended, paved the way for the gospel message to spread in all directions. This is going on now in Paul's time. So the gospel is to be preached globally. There's uh, several things that now as we run scriptures from here to there that we learn also are in relationship to the end of days and the return of Jesus Christ. We find in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 12 that the apostasy is global. Because the love of many shall grow cold, the love of many will because iniquity shall, I said the verse all wrong, I'm sorry, Matthew 24, 12, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many will grow cold. And what this means is that the apostasy is intensifying and it's spreading. It's growing stronger and it's reaching further. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 18 John says that there were many antichrists that were already in the world. Many antichrists, plural form. Now, in Revelation 13, we're talking about one antichrist. But in the process leading up to that, there are many false Christs, people who have come and propagated pseudo-truths. They've mixed a little truth and a little whole lot of deception and the next thing you know, it has watered down the faith of many, many believers and caused widespread, even global, deception. As we continue reading the writings of the Apostle Paul and Peter and ultimately John, we learn that this apostasy continues to intensify and it gets worse and worse and worse. I want us to go to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. Jumping ahead for just a moment here, and we'll come back to a couple of these other points. But I want you to see this. We're not going to take the time here since we're so limited to read all of the second chapter, but I would like to call your attention uh, to uh, verses 9 uh, down through. Uh, 12 or 13. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. Now, Peter is basically dissecting the human race into two categories. There's the just, then there is those, there is that group that is wicked, they're the ungodly, the unjust. Now, that's how God sees the world today. The just and the unjust. That was what he says. But chiefly then that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness, despise government. By the way, what we're seeing across the globe is intentional. It is satanic, spiritual warfare. The purpose driving the anarchy and uh, anti-national sentiments across the globe. We're seeing it in the United States. We've seen it in Canada. We've seen it in South America. We've seen it in Europe, Asia, the Middle East, where we have people who are protesting and rioting and causing all sorts of havoc 
because of national policies. That's what he says here. Despise government. Presumptuous are they, self-willed. They are not afraid of, to speak evil of dignities. Let's skip down to verse 12. These as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed speak evil of things they do not understand. These teenagers, these 20-somethings and above that are rioting and vandalizing and becoming more and more violent don't even understand the dynamic behind what they're protesting. Many of these people are hired guns. They're simply there to cause havoc because they get paid to do so. Now watch, he keeps going on here. They shall utterly perish in their own corruption and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots they are and blemishes sporting themselves with their own deceivings. Truth has become hate speech. Verse 14, and we're going to move on. Having eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin. Beguiling unstable souls. A heart they have exercised with covetous practice. And they've cursed the children. Now watch. We are in a generation, and it's not just one culture, it's not just one country, it's global. Remember, that's our word. There is global unrest. Global unrest. And this is being fueled by the fires of hate and prejudice and intolerance. It's Nation, race versus race, just as Jesus said in Matthew 24. And so the apostasy is global. As we watch this, Paul said in 2 Thessalonians that the Lord cannot return until there is first a falling away in apostasia occurring across the globe. We're seeing that. So this word global comes in again. Now, next you see a global system of a government is created and begins to take over. In Revelation 17, we see this nation uh, state system that has been in place literally since before the Romans became a world power. We see the city-state nation has given way. It was created by the Greek Empire and it's been the system, global system ever since. Nations, countries, kingdoms. Now all of that is melting and it's being intentionally dismantled. We are hearing more and more from the World Economic Union and uh, it's about a great reset. And essentially, it's a systematic transition from countries or nation states to a globalist system. Now, globalists believe that this is the only way to save the planet and save the human species. So we need to understand here that as we read about this new systematic restructuring, rethinking, of globalism is that they truly believe in what they're doing. They have bought into Satan's lie. In Genesis chapter 10, God separates humanity by certain standards, certain measurements. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 10. I want you to see this. God separates them way back in the 10th chapter of Genesis. They came back together again in chapter 11. A lot of people never read this. They're totally unfamiliar that after the flood occurred, when Noah came off the ark with his family in chapter 9, it was unprecedented. 
the Noah, Noah's family was all that was left of the human species on planet Earth. But we've got to get back to chapter 10 if I can get my fingers to uh, cooperate with me today. Chapter 10. Now, what I want you to see is the Bible tells us Noah, his wife, his three children, and their wives came off the ark. His three sons and their wives came off the ark. Now, the entire world was populated by these three sons, okay? Now, verse 31 of chapter 10. These are the sons of Shem. Shem, by the way, uh, is where the Caucasian races come from. These are the sons. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I've got it wrong again. Shem is where the Jewish people came from. Japheth is where the Caucasian people descended from. But verse 31, this is Shem. This is where the Jewish folks came from. They were separated after their families, after their tongues or languages, in their lands, after their nations. Those four means of separation. Now, what we read as we read through this chapter is that God did the same thing with Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the three sons. Chapter 11, verse 1, the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Verses 3 down through, where the Lord intervenes, these people who were gathered together with one language have decided to build a one system. They're going to come together and they're going to try to protect themselves against the judgment and wrath of God. And so God, once again, separates, just as he did in chapter 10. He separates the races. Since Babel, the word means confusion. Who is the author of confusion? Satan. A global system has been created. Every ruler in history has had the desire to be a global ruler. Now, in Daniel chapter 2, the Bible tells us that there will come a time. Let's go there. Like I said, we're going to go really slow uh, through this slide because there's so much here. Uh, in Daniel chapter 2, look at this with me. This is very, very important. Verse 41, chapter 2, verse 41. And whereas thou sawest the feet and the toes of this image, remember the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had with this great image. Daniel explains to him that each section of this image is, a, is an era or epoch in human history. And they're all connected, they're all tied to this one image. So we get to verse 41. Whereas thou sawest the feet and the toes. They were mixed, part of potter's clay and part of iron. The kingdom shall be divided. Now, this actually happened with Rome in 314, 315 A.D. when the Roman Empire was divided between the east and the west. The eastern part of the Roman Empire found its capital in Constantinople, which is in Turkey, modern day. The West took care of Western Asia, Europe, and so forth, and Rome became the center or the capital of the Western Roman Empire. So we see it was divided here in verse 41. He says, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou saw the iron mixed with miry clay. And the toes, now we're moving down the image and we come to the toes. The toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong but partly broken. And what this means is that its power will be very tentative, not established. There's no durability here. 
there's a weakness in this whole system. And this weakness is that the iron and the clay do not mix. They simply don't meet. Now watch, verse 43. Whereas thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Today, once again, the world is coming together. Literally, in every industrialized nation on the planet, there are migrants from other parts of the world. The immigration issue right now in the United States is a staggering crisis. The same is going on in Europe and other places as well. In fact, someone has said it this way, we are experiencing the greatest, most massive human dysphoria in the history of the human race. The nations are on the move, commingling themselves together. Now, verse 43, they're not going to mix. Now, watch this. In the days of these kings, these ten kings, okay, that he talks about here, will be the day when Jesus returns to the earth. So we're leading up to that point. And at some point, the rapture event takes place. Let's go to, to Revelation chapter 17. I think I uh, re rushed ahead and read this verse the other day. Uh, we're running quickly out of time again. But in Revelation chapter 17, verse 12 gives us some, some help here. The ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet. That takes you back to Daniel chapter 2. But they receive one power, what they receive power as kings one hour with the beast or the Antichrist. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength to the beast. So we got a one world system, a global system coming together. Remember that I said that we're global is important. Jesus gave us a series of signs that would help us to know when the end of the age had arrived and his return physically, visibly, bodily to this earth was imminent. And every one of these signs has as its common denominator this word global. Now, you and I in 2024 are literally watching the nations uh, just blend, to come together. The Great Reset we hear a lot about along with all these other uh, treaties that are being placed together. By the way, 2024 is not only an election of the United States. Uh, there are about 30 nations that are experiencing change of leadership, and it's something to watch really on the bigger scale, the bigger stage, is how many of these new leaders that will come to power will be globalist in their worldview. We're going to see more and more of this, less and less of nationalism. Even in America today, nationalism is being frowned upon. Uh, Christians are being sometimes labeled Christian nationalist. You've heard that term. And in their minds, it's a bad thing. But this is simply a march toward a global system. Our time is going to run out before we get any further. But we're talking about the gospel being preached globally. We're talking about a global government. We're talking about apostasy being global. The next thing that's coming, and it's already starting to emerge, is global persecution of the church, of the body of Jesus Christ. It's already a reality in portions of the world. Eventually, it will be global. Paul said, yea, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Now, we're going to talk next week about true faith, and we'll move forward so that we can see the exact nature of the signs that will help us better understand this event called the rapture. I hope you'll join us again next week. Until that time, God bless you.